Welcome to the bonfire, Unkindled One. Hey everyone, it's Blue Lizard Jello, and welcome back to Everything Possible in Dark Souls 3. Last time we ran through the Irithil dungeon, we dealt with a number of those pesky jailers and their horrible curse, we also saw Sigurd trapped in a cell, and hopefully, we can find him and get him rescued. So today, let's actually head to the profane capital, but first, let's talk to Ludlith, because there's one item we want to pick up for this particular build. And a fine day it is. We are going to trade the Soul of a Stray Demon for Havel's Ring. Now, we've already looked at this before, but this is going to allow us to increase our equipment load by 15%. Now, this is named after, of course, Havel the Rock, who is a good, close, personal friend of Lord Treat Gwyn. the Firekeeper not with discourtesy. And before we actually head to the Profane Capital, let's go ahead and get Havel's Ring equipped. You can see that my weight ratio up in the top right is still 70.7%, so I'm just over the cap for fat rolling. So in order to fix that, let's talk to the firekeeper. Very well. Then touch the darkness, hey. And we're going to increase our vitality by a single point and put a couple of points into strength. This will give us a little bit more damage, but more importantly, it will drop our equip load below 70%, and now we can fast roll. But before we head to the Profane Capital, let's take a look at our gear. We are using the Flamberge upgraded to plus 6. This is going to aid us greatly with a particular set of enemies later on. For armor, we have the Creighton Steel Mask, the Lothric Knight Armor, Alva Gauntlets, and the Nameless Knight Leggings. And we have the Life Ring, Estus Ring, Chloranthi Ring, and of course, Havel's Ring. And we are going to occasionally swap in the Silver Cat Ring. As for the hotbar items, one of the more important items is this cart, this Rouge, and the Kukris. We also do have an Undead Hunter Charm and Blooming Purple Moss Clump because we are going to be running into Toxicity for the first time. And Prism Stone, just so I can drop it in a couple of holes and you can see where they land. And let's just take a quick look at the stats, and of course, if you want to take a look any closer, go ahead and pause the video here. And I also want to talk about my stats for just a brief moment as we head to the Profane Capital. Someone had made a comment in one of my previous videos, and I quote, Your stats suck. And I responded in a very kindly and respectful way, and I explained that I'm actually not going for a perfect build. In fact, you might notice that my stats, well, they kind of do suck because they're all over the place and I'm not focusing on anyone in particular. And the reason for that is I want to showcase a variety of weapons. I want to showcase a variety of builds without always having to go back to Rosaria and respecking. So I don't recommend actually following along with my exact stats because you're never going to be as productive and as effective in a particular build if you do so. What you want to do is focus on the build that you're aiming for and then start pumping levels into those stats like strength, dexterity, or one of the magic stats if that's the build you're going for. I'm kind of going for more of a jack of all trades which means I will never excel in a particular type of damage. But here we are in the profane capital just running around before we actually go fight any enemies so you can get the lay of the land. I've already seen a couple of shinies here. Nothing down these stairs, so let's head back up, and we're going to fight a gargoyle, and I actually highlighted a particular point in this fight to showcase just how good the PvE Dark Souls 3 hitboxes can be sometimes. Here he is, and I'm going to use the Gold Pine Resin for some added damage. And take a look right here. In fact, that hitbox was so clean, let's back up and see it again in slow motion. I am absolutely amazed at some of the hitbox detection. Now, we had a conversation on the Facebook about this, and yes, there are times where the hitboxes are completely janky or completely wonky. But that was an example of them done very, very well. I know that the grabs, especially with the Dancer and the Mimic, they leave a lot to be desired. But sometimes you just have to marvel at how beautifully coded this game can be. With that gargoyle down, let's head up this ladder. That way we can grab the item that we saw on the ledge below when we first zoned in. And on this corpse we get... 
two rustic coins. We're going to find a number of coins in this area, and the coins themselves don't have a lot of lore anymore, but you can see it almost looks like there's an angel depicted on the coins, and there are discussions of angels later on in the game, especially once we get to Lothar Castle. We'll bring this point back up when we get to that area. Now we can head into this building, and you want to watch your step here, because they are going to try to trick you with some crystal lizards. You can see one there, but let's use the binoculars and look just in front of him. And if you look carefully, there is a hole in the floor. Okay. No big deal. We'll just go ahead and run around. And directly on the other side of this corner. See if we can get a sneak peek before he starts running. Yep, we have another crystal lizard. So we'll deal with him very quickly. Got our free twinkling titanite. And you can see a shiny dead ahead. And you're going to be tempted to go run and grab that. But... There is another hole at the top of those stairs. It's another trap. Let's go take a look at that. Very well hidden hole. And that water, that sludge down there, will cause toxicity buildup. Drop a prism stone so we can kind of get our bearings once we're down there. And now we can head down this hallway and kill this crystal lizard safely. for another Twinkling Titanite. And once again, just dropping this Prism Stone. I don't actually point it out when we're down in that area, but watch for the shinies on the ground when we're actually down in the sludge. And now we can loop around, avoid that hole, and grab a rusted gold coin, yet another coin. Now, it could just be that people were storing treasures up in the Profane Capital, including Yorm the Giant and clearly Laddersmith Gilligan as well, but I think maybe there's more connection than just the fact that it's treasure. Over here on this corpse, we get three more blooming purple moss clumps, and we are going to need them. You can see below we have some more of those Irithyll centipedes, a couple of shinies, but all of the water, all of the liquid that you see down there is going to cause Toxic to build up very rapidly. Toxicity is a higher damage form of poison, so it's something that you don't want to ignore like we do sometimes with poison. We equip the Silver Cat Ring so we can get the plunge attack on that centipede without taking any fall damage. And you can hear some skittering away, and that's because some of the centipedes over in the cave to the right have already actually become aggroed. So now, if I can get their attention, we don't want to get too many. And unfortunately take some needless damage because I missed that first hit. And some more needless damage. And you can see I am already toxified. Watch my health as it goes down fairly rapidly. And that's why we did stock up on some of these purple moss clumps. I don't want to use them as soon as I'm toxified or else I'm going to actually waste its effect. And here we have a poison gem. We've already picked one of those up before in Farron Keep. And this is the area where the prison zones are, and, well, actually, frankly, they're very hard to see. I should have actually panned the camera up, but up right above us is where you'd find those other two holes. And now over in this corpse, we get another Bite Ring. This time, it is the Curse Bite Ring. Now, we've already looked at the Bite Rings before, so it's something that we don't need to spend too much time focusing on. We know how it works at this point, but this will increase our Curse Resistance by 150 points. Now, there's not too many points of the game where you have to worry about being cursed, but there are some books in the Grand Archives, many of you will know exactly what I'm talking about, and they can prove very useful there. Once again, ignoring my toxic status for now, just so I can clear some enemies in safety. Grab a Purging Stone, some of these centipedes will drop the Purging Stones for me. And this corpse has another Purging Stone. But now let's cure that toxic heal up. And before we actually head up this ramp and up that ladder, we're going to clear the rest of these centipedes as well as a room on the bottom. Anytime you can lure the centipedes up onto the land and fight them there is going to be beneficial because you don't have to worry about the toxic status. Unless, of course, you've already been toxified and then, well, being on land does nothing for you. You can see another centipede straight ahead, so let's go ahead and take care of her. 
easy enough. We can see a very large set of doors to the right, but we have another shiny and another centipede over here. And we get another Shriving Stone in case we want to undo an infusion. But now we'll cure the Toxic, heal up, and before we actually go into this next room, I'm going to show off the Purging Stone, or at least I thought I was going to. I took off my helmet so you could see the hollowed effect, although I'm actually not showing very much hollowing, and you can see that this will reduce the Undead Curse buildup and cures hollowing, but I can't use it. And frankly, I'm completely stumped as to why I'm unable to use a Purging Stone. If any of you guys know, please let me know, because as long as you have any hollowing whatsoever, you should be able to use one of these. And at the moment, I have a hollowing level of 20 on this character. So frankly, I have no idea why I can't use it, but I'd love to hear your ideas or your knowledge. But right inside here, we have a brand new enemy type. This is what's known as a Monstrosity of Sin, or a Hand Ogre. I like to call them the Hand Hippos because I think they look like a hippopotamus with a hand for a head. These enemies are extremely susceptible to bleed. So using Kukris to get their attention is going to be a great idea because it will already start the bleed buildup. But using a Flame Burge with Karthus Rouge will make them bleed every single hit. It's incredibly effective. They also have a grab attack where they'll actually stand up and charge at you, and if you do any damage to them, you'll actually cause them to be staggered and you can get a critical. I'll do that on one of the enemies later on. You can see here that without the Karthus Rouge, it is taking a few hits to proc the bleed. But once we deal with this one, we'll head inside and deal with the other two, and you'll see just how effective bleed is. And from this particular monstrosity of sin, we get the two Dung Pies, but we also get Eleonora. Now this is a very unique weapon. This axe requires Titanite skill in order to upgrade, as if it was a boss weapon. And the skill when used, the Feast Bell, means that any hit that you actually get with this will restore about 24 HP and it will add bleed buildup. You can also trade this with the Crows for a Hollow Gem, which I think is very interesting. It has poor scaling, it has mediocre damage, but it can be very useful for Fight Clubs because when you ring it, it actually sounds like a bell. But also, I believe this might have actually belonged to a boss that may have been cut from the game. And the name Eleonora might actually suggest that this belonged to one of the daughters of Manus, the father of Chaos. It does fit the naming scheme of his other daughters, such as Nashandra, Elena, Nadalia, and Alsana from Dark Souls 2. We're also going to get some more information once we talk to Arla and we start discussing the oracles. But now with the Karthus Rouge, you can see every single hit that I do to the Monstrosities of Sin is proccing bleed, and it makes it extremely easy to kill them. Look at that damage. And from each of these monstrosities, we do get a pair of Dung Pies going right into our storage, because we're already carrying 10. Because why wouldn't you have 10 Dung Pies on you? And then inside, we just get three more Purging Stones. So going through all those monstrosities of sin just for a trio of Purging Stones might not seem worth it, but Eleonora is a pretty fun weapon to use. I actually did an entire playthrough once I collected it with the Morning Blade in my left hand and Eleonora in the right hand. It wasn't a very effective build, but it looked really cool, and it was really fun to ring a bell every now and then. Now heading up this ladder, Running around the roof, we can look inside here. There is another monstrosity of sin with an item up on a pedestal. But we'll be coming in from the top, that way we can drop down and get that item, and then we can also get the drop on that monstrosity if we desire. And now let's head to the top of the roof where we have a caster here who's also wielding a gargoyle flame hammer. And you can see he's using some spells that we don't yet have access to. He's using the homing soul mass as well as the soul spear. 
The nice thing is with the roof, you can actually use it to your advantage and you can get out of the way of most of his spells because they're actually going to hit the roof. Just watch whenever you use that Perseverance because you aren't going to knock him out of that animation most likely. But use your attacks wisely. Kill him and pick up Logan's scroll. Secret scroll of the profane capital Court Sorcerers containing sorceries of Logan. The Court Sorcerers use this scroll to claim airship to Logan's legacy, though how that claim stands up to closer scrutiny is another story. Giving this to Orbach back in Firelink Shrine will unlock the Soul Spear and the Homing Soul Mass, two sorceries that that NPC was using against us. And at this point, if you wouldn't mind, there is going to be another small transition due to some issues with the previously recorded clip. So I actually had to come back here and grab this shiny. So before you hop down, head over here to this corpse and grab 18 poison arrows. Now the poison arrows, they do have some uses throughout the game. They're not something that I've spent too much time with, but go ahead and share your experiences with them down below. And then from here, we can see this item. And we pick up the Wrath of God's Miracle. Primal Form of Force. Wrath of the Gods is an epic tale, while Force is but a woefully incomplete version of that yarn. This primal account of profound fury emits a shockwave that also inflicts damage. So just like the description implies, this is a more powerful version of Force. This time it actually does inflict damage. It does take 30 faith in order to cast. It does take two attunement slots, but it also deals physical damage. So if anyone's trying to stack against magic damage, well, this is going to bypass that. We are not going to get the drop on this monstrosity of sin because I want to showcase his grab attack and just how you can interrupt it and then get a critical. And here it is. I use a Kukri, but any attack, even a bare hand attack, will cause him to stagger. You can see that massive amount of damage just from that one critical. There's another bleed proc and then one more hit. And he is done, and two more Dung Pies are ours. Also in this room, we get the full Court Sorcerer set. Robe worn by Court Sorcerers of the Profane Capital. The formal gold stitching suggests they may have also been oracles. There are many sorcerers who claim airship to the Great Sage Big Hat Logan, and the Profane Capital houses one of two leading schools. Now the interesting thing about stating that they may have also been oracles is that we only know of one other oracle in all of Dark Souls, and that is Alsana, the silent oracle who is from Elium Lois back in Dark Souls 2. Elium Lois was a frozen city that was built on top of the Chaos Flame, and we just explored Irithil, which is a frozen city that was built on top of the Profane Flame. Doesn't take a rocket surgeon in order to make that connection. Here we clearly have a Mimic. I'm going to use the Undead Hunter charm, but I'm also going to use Karthus Ruse because I want to show you that yes, Mimics can be bled. And there's the bleed right there. And inside we get the Court Sorcerer's Staff to go along with the armor set that we just picked up. Catalyst used by the Court Sorcerers of the Profane Capital, very powerful when wielded by an exceptionally intelligent sorcerer. And that's exactly true, because at 60 intelligence, this staff will offer the highest spell power for sorceries. Now that doesn't include dark sorceries, because those are going to benefit most from the Isola staff. But you can see here, you already get an A scaling in intelligence right off the bat. And down here on this corpse, nothing special, just a piece of rubbish. But this is where you can drop down to get back to the Profane Capital Bonfire. And we'll be using this shortly. And then over here, just showing off an empty room. Nothing here. No, really, there's, there's nothing here. Except some rather unimpressive pottery. Anyway, let's go back to the roof. There are two more ways to go now. And for now, we're going to go straight up here. And at the top of these steps, we're going to take pause for a moment 
and notice something a bit odd. So we're technically now back in Irithil Dungeon, and if you notice carefully, as I'm walking, I'm actually running into something. And that's because there is something here. In fact, there are two somethings. And those somethings are Irithil Jailers. Kill them quickly, don't let them get the curse off. Well, don't get affected too much by the curse and you'll be fine. You can see my health did take quite the dip, but I'll let that regain and then use an Estus Flask and I'll be none worse for the wear. And now we get the Jailer's Key Ring. This is going to unlock three different doors. The door near the bonfire in Irithel Dungeon, the locked door that was near the Cage Hollows, as well as Carla's cell. So at the end of this episode, we'll finally be able to rescue sweet, sweet Carla. Looking down into the area where the giant was and all the rats. Now let's do some backtracking, go right back to the roof where we fought that sorcery casting NPC. And this is something I absolutely missed on my first playthrough. And that would be this window right here. It's a rather easy jump to make. And once we get to the top of the stairs, we see a locked cell door and inside, our dear friend Sigurd. My liberation requires a key. But the key is outside. Hmm. A riddle for the ages. But we have the old cell key from that one mimic we fought near the basilisks, and now we can rescue him. Oh, you are a saint. Once again, you are my valiant savior. I, Zygvard of Katarina, express my deepest gratitude. Take this, a token of my thanks. Go on, it's all yours. And we get our very first Titanite slab. This will give us the ability to upgrade any normal weapon up to plus 10, or any boss or unique weapon up to plus 5. Ah, no, please. Go on ahead. I've my own road to take, and a duty to fulfill. Very soon. And inside a cell we also get the covetous gold serpent ring. A gold ring depicting a snake that could have been, but never was, a dragon. Fallen foes are more likely to drop items. Snakes are known as creatures of great avarice, devouring prey even larger than themselves by swallowing them whole. If one's shackles are cause for discontent, perhaps it is time for some old-fashioned greed. Wearing this ring will increase your item discovery by 50, and this ring does stack with other item discovery, so you can get your item discovery up even further. And we are now done with this side section. So now, let's go back inside where we fought that last monstrosity of sin. And then we'll run back to that hole in the wall where we picked up the rubbish and we can drop down and keep going further into the profane capital. Climbing up this very long ladder in order to get back. And then we are going to go and rest at the bonfire because at this point any enemies that respawn are going to be behind us so we don't have to worry about that. Also it's always nice to go and see our dear friend Laddersmith Gilligan. Well, I guess it's not really nice in his current state. Greed really will get the best of you though. And rest it up. Let's slide down this ladder, and ignore the texture pop in in just a moment. Although I just called it out so it makes it harder to ignore, I understand that. And from here, we have this one bridge to the left and we can see a flame that is surrounded by a few different enemies, and while they look like jailers, they are not quite. Those are actually flame handmaids. You can see that basin is shooting flames at us, so we want to avoid that, but we also have a gargoyle to deal with. So the safest way that I've found of fighting him is actually just to get his attention and then lead him back to a spot where the flames can't hit us. Up here should be sufficient. And now we should be able to make quick work of him with the gold pine resin. Always nice to get the stagger with the bonus damage afterwards. And 
I tried to break his guard, but it ended up killing him instead. And I think that's just fine. Oh, and what did we get? The Gargoyle Flame Spear. Stone Torch Spear, wielded by gargoyles of the Profane Capital. The Profane Flame, which never goes out, imbues this weapon with a fire attack. And it seems that that basin with fire may very well contain the Profane Flame. But if you look below at the attribute bonus, this has four way scaling. Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, and Faith. Now don't think that every time that you upgrade one of those stats, you're going to get overall better damage in both physical and fire. Instead, if you upgrade Strength and Dexterity, your physical attack will go up. If you upgrade Intelligence or Faith, that's when your fire damage will increase. Back to the bridge, you can see here we could drop down safely. But before we do that, I'm going to continue on the bridge and grab these Onus Slayer Great Arrows. By the way, an Oni is a type of demonic or mythical creature in Japanese mythology. We have a large soul of a weary warrior, and then heading inside, down these stairs, you can see all of the treasure all over the ground here. Greed is definitely something to consider when you're exploring the profane capital. And here we have a number of these profane flame handmaids, but we also have, up above, we have a gargoyle. Ideally, we don't fight all of these at once. Also, the treasure is littered with the charred corpses of the previous citizens. Now while these enemies don't do a lot of damage, they do like to gang up on you, and then anytime you try to hit one of them, another one will cast a fireball or hit you with their dagger, and cause you to be staggered and take additional damage. So it's best to try to pull them as individually as possible, or at least use the environment to your advantage by getting behind some of the pillars. Any charged heavy attack or a black firebomb will cause them to be thrown to the ground, making them a little bit easier to deal with. Oh, and look, the gargoyle decided to fly down very sneakily. Once again, using the gold pine resin. Took a lot of damage there because he did break my guard. Which I just tried to do to him, and I was woefully out of range, but there it is. Get some bonus damage. And he is done. Now, he was using the Gargoyle Flame Hammer, so he is one of the gargoyles that could potentially drop that weapon if you're looking for it. And now we can deal with these handmaids that are surrounding the Profane Flame. Fairly easy to deal with, just one at a time. And just one left. This is also very reminiscent to the Tower of Latria back in Demon Souls, where you actually had a couple of chains that were in a similar looking vessel that was actually holding up a giant beating heart. Although the difference being, once you kill these enemies, this does not actually get extinguished and no chain is released. And we got the Handmaid's Dagger. This weapon upon a successful hit will restore one of your focus points, two if it's held in the offhand. Kind of strange. It shares the skill blind spot with the Corvian Great Knife and it does attack around shields. Dagger used by Handmaids of the Profane Capital. It is said that these women took pleasure in wounding others. I guess that's true. But I guess it's true of anyone. Some people just want to see the world burn. And before we go back to the bridge and get that one item by dropping down, we have another room completely full of handmaids, and they are also protected by a gargoyle. And before the gargoyle drops down, let's try to deal with as many of these handmaids as we can. Once again, we don't want to get into a gank situation. Using Kukris, I can deal with them at range very easily. And now I'm actually going to use Kukris to try to get this gargoyle's attention. 
Unfortunately, I don't have a bow or else this would have been much easier. Almost. Really feel like that should have hit, but oh well. Let's just get a little closer and he'll drop down on his own anyway. Dagger. And one more hit. And he's done. And now we just need to deal with the rest of these handmaids. All seven of them. So I'll get some of their attention. Then I'm going to run back, which should actually cause them to chase me. Perfect. Now the trick to fighting the handmaids in a group is just to not get greedy. Which is typically the rule whenever you're playing Dark Souls in any capacity. Get one, maybe two hits in, and then start strafing around so you're not getting hit by any of the off-screen fire attacks. Still have a few left, so we don't want to get all their attention if we can help it. Luring them away from the others, perfect. Couple of hits, back up. One down. Missed the R2. And another one down. Oh, and look, another handmade dagger. Just a couple more handmaids left, and then we can deal with all of these wonderful chests. Once again, hitbox at play there. And the last of the handmaids go down, we get yet another dagger, and now we can loot. Over here, the chain is a bit hard to see. But when in doubt, go ahead and give it a whack. And we get a single ember from this chest, and now, these pair of chests sitting side by side well, taking a quick look at the chains and seeing that they're breathing, we know that both of these are mimics. Now this is the ideal spot for farming the symbol of avarice, because if you have any undead hunter charms, unfortunately I do not, you can throw one in the middle and actually hit both of them. Doing that will give you a chance per chest every time you use an undead hunter charm in order to get the symbol of avarice. But instead of using an undead hunter charm, watch what I foolishly do. That's right, I accidentally hit both. So now let's see if I can get out of this skirmish alive. One down. And another down. Look at that, didn't even take any damage. Go me. And inside this one, we get the Great Shield of Glory, another callback to Dark Souls 2. This shield is upgraded with Twinkling Titanite, and wielding it will actually lower your stamina regeneration. It does have 80 stability, though, to make up for that. This shield actually belonged to King Vendrick's personal knight, Xian. A great shield adorned with flowing patterns, a celebration of an ancient glory boasts the highest ability of such shields, but with reduced stamina regeneration speed. Perhaps it is glory that begets indolence. And then from the other mimic, we just get two rusty gold coins. But now everything is clear up until the boss, which is right through that fog. So let's go back to the bridge. That way we can hop down and get the last little bit of loot before we fight the next boss, which also happens to be a Lord of Cinder. Equipping the Silver Cat Ring just to make sure I don't take any unnecessary fall damage. And on this corpse, we get the Onus Slayer Grapo to go along with the Onus Slayer Great Arrows we just picked up. 
a unique great bow handed down in an eastern land where tales are told of its use in slaying great horned oni. Drawing a bow of this size takes time and leaves the user vulnerable. Only specialized great arrows can be fired from the bow. The skill is puncturing arrows so you can actually fire through multiple enemies at the same time. This weapon is upgraded with Twinkling Titanite, has 63 range, which is very good, and it looks extremely similar to the Elan Great Bow. I wonder if we can make any connections using that information. Carefully just hopping down these various ledges. Although I don't need to be too careful since I do have the Silver Cat Ring equipped. And we actually saw this item very early on in the video. Directly above us is the tower that contains the bonfire. And we get a rustic coin here. And then over here to the left, we get another rustic coin. We do have a couple of gargoyles overlooking us, but those are truly just statues and they aren't going to come to life. Even though the 90s Nickelodeon cartoon would have us believe they would. But now it's time to go through this fog gate. And there are no NPC summons for this fight, but that doesn't mean we have to fight alone. of Katarina have come to uphold my promise. Let the sun shine upon this Lord of Cinder. If you've been following Secret's questline, he will actually aid you in fighting Yorm the Giant because he has to keep a promise to his friend. You can also see him using a very unique weapon that does a lot of damage. Let's see if we can do the same amount of damage. 79. Another 79, okay? Not quite, but he's doing almost 2,800 points of damage, and that's because he's using the Storm Ruler, which we can pick up right about now. We'll look at this weapon closer later on, but for now, Let's go ahead and see what we can do with it. When you two-hand it and you use the weapon skill and hold it in to charge it up, you get the power of the storms, and you can use it on Yorm for massive damage. Now you can kill him without using the Storm Ruler, it just takes some time. But he can also be staggered. If you can hit his head enough times, he'll actually drop to his knees and allow you to perform a critical attack. Now with Sigurd by your side, this fight should not take very long because you can just keep trading hits on Yorm. But even if you're playing a solo, the trick is dodge an attack and start charging your skill because as soon as you knock him to your knees, you should be able to charge the skill again and then allow yourself to get another free attack as soon as you dodge his next swing. Sigurd gets the final blow and Yorm the Giant, the Lord of Cinder, is no more and we get the Cinders of a Lord, as well as the Soul of Yorm the Giant. With him out of the way, let's stop and take a look at some of the items that we've just gotten. Great Sword with a Broken Blade, also known as the Giant Slayer, for the residual strength of Storm that brings Giants to their knees. A quick note about this description because it might be a little bit misleading. This skill only brings Yorm to his knees. It does not do any bonus damage, either physical or stagger damage, to other giants. Yorm the Giant once held two of these, but gave one to the humans who doubted him, the one that we just picked up, and left the other to a dear friend, Sigurd, before facing his fate as a Lord of Cinder. You can see here that the skill is called Storm King. This is a direct callback to Demon Souls. In Demon Souls, you fought a boss known as the Storm King, and in order to fight him from a distance because he was a flying Manta Rite type boss, you actually had to use the Storm Ruler. Pretty cool callback. Soul of Yorm the Giant. 
Yorm is the descendant of an ancient conqueror, but was asked by the very people once subjugated to lead them, serving as both a weighty blade and a stone-hard shield. Lonely Yorm became a lord of Cinder to put the profane flame to rest, knowing full well that those who spoke of him as lord were quite insincere. It seems I am in your debt once again. My thanks. I could have not kept my promise without you. Now, for a final toast. Once again, we get another Sigbroi. To your valor, and my old friend Yorm. Long may the sun shine. <laughs> Well, I'm going to have myself a little nap. The only thing to do, really, after a nice toast. You are a true friend. Best of luck with your duty. If you've been playing the Souls games for any length of time, you may very well know that any NPC who is on a quest, once their duty is fulfilled or their purpose is passed, they don't really have a reason to go on living. For our dear friend Sigurd, putting down Yorm, one of his friends, was his duty. And to us he leaves behind the storm ruler that was given to him by Yorm, his shield, as well as his entire armor set. Thank you for the journey, friend. With Yorm defeated, it is now time to go back to Irithil Dungeon and unlock those few remaining doors and rescue Carla once and for all. Once we get to the bonfire, head into the next room. And then we can unlock this cell, and on the corpse we get a rusted gold coin. Now there'll be a quick transition here because I did grab these items out of order. So for now, I'm just going to run past as many enemies as I can. Although I am going to stop and get a plunging attack on this jailer. It'll make getting this item a lot easier. Just watch for the caged hollows. Now, rolling past them, we can unlock this door. And we get the Prisoner Chief's Ashes. Handing these ashes into the Shrine Handmaid will unlock the Rhine Blue Moss Clump, Pale Pine Resin, and Carla's Armor Set. Speaking of Carla, we still need to go rescue her, as well as grab that one item that unfortunately I missed in the last episode. Once again, just running past as many enemies as I can. You can see the Storm Ruler not doing very great damage, but that's okay, we can use it to knock him out of the way. And fortunately, I still have the Silver Cat Ring equipped. And now there will be another small transition right here. Now we can jump on this elevator that will bring us very close to the room where Carla is being kept, which, if you recall, is guarded by a number of jailers. If you want to play this smart, go ahead and kill all the Jailers just like we did last time, one at a time, and just be cautious. Or, you can be foolhardy like me, and decide not to kill any of the Jailers, and just make a mad dash. Although I'm not foolish enough just to run straight ahead instead, I'm going to go over to the left, and go through the room that's full of wretches that will allow me to bypass at least some of the Jailers. Through this room and down the hallway that contained the Mimic. 
I'm now past most of the jailers, so now if I just run straight across, you can see the shiny right there that I missed. But as long as I get into this cell quickly, the jailers actually should lose interest. I'm going to wait over here next to the wall just in case any of them do catch up to me, because they can and will kill Carla if you're not careful. But it looks like they don't care about me anymore, so now, everyone, meet Carla. Oh, there you are. I thought you'd all but forgotten me. How sweet. Good to know that a skinny little heretic can still turn heads. Hmm? Oh, you're not one of them, are you? Accept my apologies for mistaking you for one of those leeches. So, what business have you here? This is a land of monstrosities. And I am no exception. Carla is known as a spurned child of the Abyss, and we actually met someone who is seeking the spurned, Alva, just outside of Irithel Dungeon. A wretched child of the Abyss. Is that something you can forgive? Oh, really? You are no ordinary woman. Very well. Besides, I've grown tired of imprisonment. I am Carla, and I accept your proposal. Carla has already stated that she is a wretched child of the Abyss. Is she a shard of Manus? Once again, her name actually does fit the naming scheme along with Nishandra, Elena, Nadalia, Alsana, and maybe even Eleonora. Alright, let's grab this ember. We've already gotten stabbed once. You can see I'm fat rolling because of my reduced equipment load. My health is dwindling very quickly. Time to get a homeward bone ready, but now is not the place. Let's get a little bit further, and now I should be safe enough to head back to Firelink. And that was a close one. Now that we're back in Firelink, we have a number of things to turn in. First, let's start with the Shrine Handmaid. Ah, well met, Ashen One. How may I be of service? We can turn in the Prisoner Chief's Ashes. Gracious. Passing <laughs> And you can see we've unlocked the Rhyme Blue Moss Clum. The Pale Pine Resin, as well as Carla's Set. If we take a look at the description, I won't pause on it for too long. It simply states that it is torn and odorous, indicating that she was in prison for quite a long time. Ashen One. Speaking of Carla, after this quick transition, let's go ahead and talk to her and hand in a number of tomes. Ah, oh, there you are. As I said, I am Carla, and I'm grateful to you. Now, what shall we do? The only thing that might interest you is my sorcery. Although my dark arts are a detestable sort, that wouldn't interest you, would it? Hmm. You're a wicked one, aren't you? Very well. Humans are of the dark, and you are no different. Some may avert their eyes, but the truth remains the truth. Be careful, though. Few humans are privy to this knowledge. Let it be a secret, kept between you and I. We can learn affinity and dark edge. Affinity has some homing abilities and will deal dark damage, and Dark Edge is like a dark version of the Soul Greatsword, also dealing dark damage. Oh, a pyromancy tome, have we? Quilana, Witch of Isolith. Well, this is a fascinating pyromancy. Very well, if this is your wish. I will unravel the thing the best I can. Besides, it will be nice to play master for once. And with this tome, we can now unlock Fire Whip, which is a sweeping pyromancy with a very cheap focus point cost, 
Firestorm, which will erupt pillars of flame all around the character, and Rapport, which will last for 30 seconds and it'll cause your target to become an ally. Oh, another pyromancy tone, have we? And one that resonates with the dark. Yes, well suited to me. <laughs> I may be a heretical sorcerer, but you bring me nothing but pyromancies. Fiendish little lass, you. And now we're given the Black Flame, which is a dark version of the Great Combustion, and it does do higher damage than Great Combustion. And we get the Black Fire Orb, which is a dark damage version of Fire Orb. Oh, is this a divine tome? What on earth are you thinking? I wouldn't go near a divine tome, or any so-called miracle. And casters of miracles are sure to steer clear of me. So please, don't torture me so. Even though she doesn't want to take it at first, just be insistent. Ah, oh, you. How could you? Oh, I know, I know, I owe my life to you, fine then, but just this once, I will tell you this tale, but do understand, it will be my first time, I'll have no sniggering should I err. And now we have two miracles unlocked, Deep Protection, which is a self buff, which will increase your damage by 5%, your absorptions by 5, resistances by 10, and gives you increased stamina regen, all for 60 seconds. Then we also have Gnaw. This miracle will deal dark damage and cause bleed buildup on your target, much like Doris's Gnawing, although Doris's Gnawing is an upgraded version of Gnaw, so if you can use it, it's oh. definitely going to be more beneficial. And now we've unlocked the Vow of Silence Miracle. Casting this will prevent all spell casting in the area, including yourself, and it does work on a couple of bosses, namely the Deacons of the Deep and Aldrich, both of whom will be almost useless without their spell casting abilities. And then we have Dead Again, a miracle that is cast on corpses around you. When those corpses are cursed with Dead Again, they will then explode and deal dark damage to any enemies around them. Do stay safe. Don't forget, we also picked up Logan Scroll, so let's talk to Orbeck. Back again, I see. Perfect timing, too. I'm in need of a diversion. Oh my. You've made quite the discovery. This is a scroll of the prodigious Big Hat Logan. A masterful sorcerer, long missed in Vinheim. And now we have a scroll. Right here in my very hands. And with that scroll, we can now learn Homing Soul Mass and Soul Spear. Now, Homing Soul Mass, as you've seen in use, will cause some homing projectiles to form around the caster's head. It will give you three projectiles at 20 intelligence, four at 24 intelligence, and five projectiles at 32 intelligence. And then, of course, there's Soul Spear, which does have some piercing properties and can deal some really good damage. Promise to stay safe. We've nearly turned everything in that we can, but let's go talk to Ludlith because we do have Yorm's soul, and let's see what we can transpose. By the way, if you want to consume Yorm's soul because you don't like what Ludlith has to offer, you will get 20,000 souls for it. Aha, thou returned, and a fine day it is. Here we have Yorm's great machete. Yorm once lumbered on the front lines with a great shield, but one day, in place of his shield, a left-hand notch was added to his machete, enabling the smashing technique that would become the legacy of his later years. It does have the war cry skill, so you will actually get a boost in damage, and if you follow it up, you will do an incredibly powerful ground slam. You can see that 38 strength is required to wield this in one hand, and when it's upgraded, you'll actually get an A scaling in strength once you reach at least plus 4. And then we have the Great Shield. As a lord, Yorm risked everything and fought unflinchingly as a one-man vanguard. Following the loss of the one he wished to protect, he forsook his shield. I've actually heard a theory that Carla is the one that he wished to protect, although I don't have too much to back that up. 
It does have the shield bash ability if that's your thing. It does also increase your poise by 45. It has some pretty good overall absorption, although it is very heavy and it requires 40 strength if you want to one hand this. Treat the firekeeper not with discourtesy. We have one last thing to take care of before we actually sign off, and now we have to offer the cinders of the Lord Yorm to his throne. And ladies and gentlemen, that is going to do it for this episode of Everything Possible. I hope you learned something, and if you did, please leave me a comment below and let me know what you learned. And if I missed something, as always, you have to leave that as well. That way, we can all keep learning. But I thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.